This is an interview I've been looking forward to for a long time. We're here with Jack Phillips, author of a new book called The Cost of My Faith, but you probably recognize him because he has been at the heart of a Supreme Court case and really what might be called a cultural battle over religious freedom. Owns a cake shop in Colorado and uh, refused to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding and to put it bluntly, all hell broke loose, so to speak, culturally speaking. And Jack is with us today as well. Jonathan Scruggs from ADF uh, to weigh in if any legal issues come up. Jack, I'm so honored you would be on this call. And let me let me just ask you a question. I'm so curious. Sure. Just tell me the backstory before we get into some of the issues of the case and culture, what's going on. How did you become a baker and why did you want to do this in the first place? Well, in the cost of my faith, I, I tell about that story. Um, you know, I grew up with just, I loved art. So I was always drawing and painting and sculpting and things. And then in my senior year of high school, we had to uh, sit down and talk with a career counselor. He asked me, what do you want to do? I told him, I'd like to be an architect. And he looks at my transcripts and he says, you don't have the math for it. Okay. I thought that would be handy information a couple of years ago. <laughs> and then he said, what's your next choice? I'd like to be an artist. There's no money in it. So I end up getting, you know, a job as a laborer, I guess. But a man across the, that lived across the street from me owned a uh, large wholesale bakery. And he was gracious enough to hire me. And soon I fell in love with baking. So put the two together. Uh, that's awesome. That makes perfect sense. Now, this book is titled The Cost of My Faith. So your faith is at the heart of your decision to fight this cake yeah. and also open Masterpiece Cake Shop masterpiece cake shop will you tell us just the story i found it so fascinating the book of you coming to faith yeah it's uh i was coming home from work i worked at at this bakery still the wholesale bakery with like 100 employees and i worked a night shift so i'd get off at you know anywhere between 6 and 10 in the morning and one morning my buddy says you want to run over to the bar with us you know and i said oh no thanks i think i'll just head home so i hopped in my car and i was driving home and i was like five minutes from home and suddenly I felt that there was a, a person in my car, a presence in my car. I'm not sure there was just, no, I wasn't alone. And I knew immediately it was the Holy Spirit. Wow. And as I drove down the road, you know, on, on the, a road that's like 40 miles an hour, this whole thing takes like seconds. And the Holy Spirit convicts me that I was a mm -hmm. sinner. And you know, I'd grown up in church in Sunday school and none of it made any sense. I quit going to church like five years before. Okay. And suddenly the whole plan of salvation, Christ dying on the cross, paying for my sins, all those things, my guilt before, you know, holy God just was so clear from all the Sunday school stories, everything. And uh, I realized I was a sinner. I needed a savior. There was no other possibility, but that it was Jesus Christ. And this was the Holy Spirit rescuing me. And so I uh, you know, tried to negotiate. I said, you know, let me clean up my life a little bit and you'll get a better deal. <laughs> and he says, yeah, yeah, you can't. And I realized, you're right. I can't. I'm yours. Hmm. So just like that, I became a follower of Christ and, and never looked back. So my faith then has had an impact on everything that I do, the way that I raise my kids, the way I run my business, all of those things. There's so much about your marriage and your backstory and your experience that we're skipping over here that you go through in the book. And I yeah. honestly, I couldn't put it down. I really hope people will pick up the cost of my faith because it's well written, it's fascinating, it's timely. But okay. let's l let's jump to you starting Master Peak Cake Shop. I'm curious, why did you start it, and what's significant about the name? Well, shortly after I started working in the, the bakery, I thought this is a, a job that I can do long term. You know, there were people working at this wholesale place that were like 50, 60 years old and still enjoying the job. You know, I can enjoy doing this, too. But eventually I'd like to own my own bakery. Hmm. And then uh, the owner of the bakery bought out another shop that had cake decorators. And when I saw how they could employ their art on a cake, turn a cake into a canvas, uh, that's what it's that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open my own bakery and it'll be a cake shop. And I knew the name immediately would be Masterpiece Cake Shop because mm -hmm. Masterpiece says art, cake shop says cakes. So, um, you know, you're not going to go in looking for a loaf of bread. And uh, <laughs> um, also then in, in Masterpiece as a new follower of, of Christ, I've 
the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. And so I wanted to use that part of masterpiece to remind me every day when I come to work, who am I going to serve? So all those things came together. That's a brilliant double name that masterpiece tells people they're getting something of the highest quality, but also kind of subtly in there is the master that you serve. So, so people understand from the beginning, opening this bakery always has been an expression of who you are and who you are is tied to your faith. Is that true? Absolutely. The, you know, every decision I make, the way that I treat my employees, I Mm -hmm. say the way I handle my marriage, my money, raise my kids. All those were based on my relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have a clue how to bake a cake. I was interested in reading through your book. Like, how, yeah, I really don't. I was more athlete background and really can't cook anything. But I was reading through, you're describing your backstory, some of the cakes that you've made. Just pick maybe two or three over the decades of doing this that were just the most special or fun or meaningful cakes that you made for some event or some person. Um, there's a picture in my book of a, a warehouse cake that we made a new, uh, you know, grocery store distributor or food distributor was opening up a brand new warehouse. And so we made a, a cake that was like on a board that was 10 feet long and six feet wide, or eight feet wide, whatever. We had to transport it in sections to get it to the site. Um, the trees that we, you know, bought the trees, but we made everything out of icing and that was a lot of fun or just simple cakes like, hmm. um, did one recently for, you know, a, a woman who just turned 103 and just like, what is she like? And so it a, a cake that we do quite often, but a, a beautiful flower basket. Mm. And uh, that just sometimes it's just the cake is simple. Sometimes it's really dramatic, mm. but it's always who you're making it for and what the event is that really makes it special sometimes. Jack, one of the things that jumped out to me in your book is how you talked about your bakery brought your family together. I'm yep. close with my parents, with my kids, the McDowell's just, we are family oriented people. So when I read that, yep. I just, because I haven't owned a bakery and been there, I had, I had not really thought about it on that level. But you talk about how this brought you closer to your dad before he passed away and right. how it's brought you closer to your daughter. Would you share a little bit about that? Well, with my dad, my dad was a meat cutter and, uh, he worked in retail. He worked in like packing houses and different things when he was young. But while I was growing up, he worked in meat markets and he just hated working with the public. And uh, he said, I don't care what you do, son. Just don't work with the public. <laughs> and <laughs> then I've got this brilliant idea to open a retail bakery. And it was like, I wasn't afraid to tell my dad because my dad and I get along great. You know, Good. But I was like, Dad, this is probably the dumbest decision in my life you're going to think. I'm going to open up a, a bakery. Really? When? Where? And he came in the very first day, helped me oh, wow. build out the store. And he was there virtually every day until he, he passed away back in 96. But that was a really special time getting to meet my dad, sit down and talk and have breakfast. And he befriended everybody that came in. So wow. it was always fun. That's special. Now, your daughter works for you, too. Is that right? Or she did yeah. for a while? Yeah, I have three kids and they all work there okay. at different points. And uh, one of my daughters was all excited that I was going to be on your show because she watches your show all the time. So she's watching oh, tonight. Oh, my goodness. I, I yeah. tell her. I, actually, I'll just say hi right here. Give her a shout out. What's her name? Jennifer. Jennifer, thanks for watching. You have a great dad yeah. and a great family. You are more blessed <laughs> than you know. Um, yeah. In a second, I want to jump to the day that changed everything for <clears throat> you. When David yeah. and Charlie came in and asked you to bake a same-sex uh, bake right. a cake for a same-sex wedding. But I'm curious, do you remember the very first sale that you had at the bakery? Do you remember that? I do. I even write about it in the cost of my faith because we were up, you know, spending weeks trying to get the cake shop ready to open. And then the night before, I'm pulling cakes out of the oven and I get up in the morning and I ice the first one. And I'm ready to put it in the store. It's not an order or anything. It's just hopefully somebody will come in and sell it or buy it. Sure. And so this, this gentleman walks in and he says, yeah, I need a cake. And, um, well, I have this one right here. Great. Can you write something on it for me? I sure can. So I write on it, hand it to him, box it up. And say, you know, you're my first customer. Really like the first one today? No, my first one ever. Wow. We just We just unlocked the doors. And this man still comes in. He was in oh, probably in February. So that's so cool. What a great story. Great now, you served for years. 
uh, talked about how the love of Christ motivated the way you treat your employees, people that came in. But on a specific day, a gay couple came in, David and Charlie, asked you to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. You said no, and in the book you say there was 20 seconds that changed everything. Describe that scenario for us if you can. Yeah, so it was a beautiful July afternoon. It was Thursday, July the 19th, 2012. And it's about 4, 4.30 in the afternoon. And I had two girls working in the store and I was working in the back. And you know the protocol was that one girl would take care of the customers that came in, the other would answer the phone. If they're both busy, then I would you know pick up the phone or wait on whoever. And as it happened, these two men came in, sat at our wedding desk in a special area we have designed just for weddings, wedding cakes on display. And I looked out because uh, both of them were busy and I want to make sure. And they, you know, they were both busy and one of them motioned to me, my other daughter, Lisa, and uh, there are two guys over there. So, okay. And so I went around to the wedding desk and I sat down and said, um, you know, one of them says, I'm David, I'm Charlie. And I didn't hear what he said. I said, excuse me, which, you know, oh, Charlie. Oh, okay. I'm Jack. What can I do for you? David said, we're here to look at wedding cakes. And Charlie says, it's for our wedding. And uh, right away, I knew what my answer was going to be. I just didn't know how I was going to phrase it or how they would accept it. But it's like, sorry, guys, I don't do cakes for same-sex weddings. They just mm-hmm. stared at me like, what? Like, you know, I'm making birthday cakes, shower cakes, sell you cookies, brownies. I just don't do create cakes for same-sex weddings. David immediately jumps up and he flips me off. He storms out of one door and he's just yelling all the way. And the other guy, Charlie, picks up his folder that he had with him and walks over to one of the tables. There was a woman sitting there that I hadn't noticed. It turns out that that was his mom. And so they uh, gathered up their stuff and went out the other door. Wow, that's not what I expected. But the whole conversation was like 19 words, 20 words, and 20 seconds. And I was just stunned. Now, you make this clear in your <clears throat> book, but you emphasize, because it feels like people misunderstand this, that you were not denying them service because of their sexual orientation. Oh, you right. have served gay people. It was about the message itself. Is is that fair? That's, yeah, absolutely fair and accurate. Um, if you look at a wedding cake, think about a wedding cake. Say you were on a business conference and um, you're headed down to the room at the hotel and you don't remember which one it is and you open up you know door number one and you see a cake standing in the corner on the table over there you don't think it's a business meeting it might be yours it could be something else you know instinctively it's a wedding Mm -hmm. because of that cake that wedding cake is a message in and of itself it's very iconic so when they asked for a cake that was to represent a wedding that was you know against the biblical teaching that i believe um that was just something that i couldn't create and I try it in those few sentences, you know, tell you, I'll sell you cookies and brownies. I'll make other custom cakes for you. I just can't do that one. Now, talk to me about some <clears throat> of the other cakes that you had decided you wouldn't make. And it sounds like this wasn't a decision when they came in. But when you opened up the shop, you had already right. made a decision with your wife about this. So give me some examples of other times you've said no to baking certain certain cakes. Yeah. Um, it, when I had the dream to open the cake shop at first, you know, it's not like, okay, let's do this. And next week I'm open. It was, you know, years in, in the process, planning okay. everything. And one of the things that we had talked about was which cakes we would create and which cakes we could not. And we decided, you know, we're not going to create cakes to celebrate Halloween, which is a huge money-making okay. part of bakery life. Um, we're not going to make cakes that are anti-American or that are racist or, you know, even disparage other people you know, call them other, you know, call people names or insult people, even people who identify as LGBT. Um, we wouldn't make cakes with, you know, profanity on them. So there were a number of cakes. And the media kind of tries to make it look like, you know, he picked out these two guys and sure. he won't serve days. But it's it's the message of the cake. And there are a lot of cakes that we can't create. So if there was another Christian baker who started their bakery <clears throat> and called it something else, but similar vision and said, you know what, I don't have a problem baking a cake for a same-sex wedding. Right. Would you say, no, you shouldn't? Or would you say, then make it according to your conscience? I would say the latter. You know, it's up to okay. each person and it's up to our government to protect the rights that God's given us that we have written down in our constitution, the right of free speech and the right to freely exercise our religion. So for that person, I'd say, you know, that's up to you. I have to answer for God, answer to God for okay. my own actions. 
fair enough. So you say no within 20 seconds later, uh, get flipped off, yelled at. Talk to me about some of the ensuing things that happened over a few days, the response positive and negative uh, that you received. Well, the first couple of days, it was entirely negative, starting 20 minutes after the two men left my shop. Wow. Um, the phone rings. And I said earlier that, you know, two girls working for me, one would answer the phone, the other would be waiting on the customers. They were both busy. So I grabbed the phone. And uh, so I, are you the guy who just turned away the gay couple? It's like, what world are you talking about? You know, nobody was here, but the three of us and the two men. So I would never turn away anybody. Um, well, actually, I would never turn away what you did refuse to make a wedding cake for him. Um, God, trying to explain everything. And then the man spews out a bunch of profanity and hangs up on me. Like I was as stunned at that as I was for the two men, you know, storming out of my shop. Sure. And then the phone rang again and then it rang again and it rang again. And by the time I closed up just like 45 minutes later, I'd probably taken six phone calls like that. Like what in the world's going on? And then the next morning, Friday morning, I came in, and uh, I was here before seven. We opened at seven, but I was here like an hour before that. And the phone was already ringing. And I decided I wasn't going to answer the phone. I stopped ringing. <laughs> I stopped answering the phone that night on wow. Thursday night at six when it closed. And for me, normally, if, you, if I'm here at 10 o'clock at night and the phone rings, I'm going to answer it. You come sure. up to my door, I'm going to let you in. But that sure. night, I thought, I'm not answering the phone tonight. And in the morning, it was ringing at seven o'clock. I picked up the phone and it was the same thing. Continued all day long. There's profanity and threats and just hateful phone calls it's crazy now you and that to- continued you told- i continued all day friday and saturday and monday tuesday Wednesday. oh my goodness so it just kept going for a while non-stop yeah now you you told a couple specific stories that frankly i stopped and i was reading it last night i told my wife i'm like can you believe what happened here and one was about a man who threatened you with a gun explain what happened there and how you responded yeah so This was early. I'm thinking it was probably the first week that this all started. And uh, um, there was just the phone calls just kept coming. And I decided, you know, you know, while I'm open, I'll answer the phone and I'll also open it and I'll be polite and I'll be as charming as I can be to whoever calls. And if I have a chance to share the gospel, I'll do that. And I pick up the phone and this man says, I'm on my way to your shop. Okay, and I've got a gun. Wow. Hmm. I'm going to blow your head off. Holy cow. And then he hangs up and then he calls back and he called back and he called back. He says, I'm on this street. I'm on that street. And I'm about 10 minutes away. Jeez. And so I don't know what to do. You know, I'm not afraid to die, but uh, I don't want to do it with my daughter in the back and my three-year-old granddaughter with her. Gosh. And so I went back and told her, I just got this phone call. I'm not sure what to do, but you guys stay in the back. I'm going to go call the police. So I call the police and the, I explained to the dispatcher, you know, I just had this man threatened to come and kill me. And so they, could you send a, uh, an officer out? And so he showed up pretty quickly. And yeah. uh, I, I, you know, explained to him what was going on, the story of the two, you know, David and Charlie coming in. And uh, then the phone keeps ringing. And caller ID just showed a series of numbers. It didn't, you know, give a name or anything like that. And I say, you want to take the call? He said, sure. So he tries to pick it up and there's nobody there. Hang up call again, hang up, call again, hang up, call again. And uh, I don't know if maybe the guy was, it was just a crank call or if he, you know, pulled by the parking lot and saw a police car in front and, you know, thought better of his decision. And, uh, but to my knowledge, I never heard from that man again. That was, that was a wake up call. Now, all of this you're talking about is negative, but you did receive some positive feedback of people who appreciate the principle. And you tell one story about, if I remember correctly, a big guy, muscles everywhere, tattoos, yeah. served in the military. Tell about this guy. Yeah. He's just, and he could be 150 pounds. I don't know, but in my mind, knowing his background, <laughs> he was just one tough guy. He was my age and he came in and he was in Vietnam. He was in okay. black ops and, and he said, you're my hero. Wow. Just, I was just overwhelmed. We had a long conversation. We've had many conversations since, but he brought a, a special medallion, not a, a war medal like a Purple Heart or anything like that, but a medallion that um, his company had created for each other, and he gave me one. And wow. so I've got that at a special place in my office. But um, I'm talking to him, and I don't know if you can see with the camera here, but 
you know, it chokes me up when I think about the, sure. you know, that conversation in this man. And he, <laughs> black ops, Vietnam, you know, behind the lines doing all the crazy things. And he's in tears telling me that I'm his hero. So, Jack, because of what I do, I receive a good amount of criticism pretty much daily on sure. whether it's this YouTube channel yeah. or it's on social media. But when I was reading your book, I thought I have 2% at best of what you've received. How did you just emotionally or spiritually even cope with this? Well, we were just talking. My daughter just is reading the book and she's like, I'm on chapter 15 and, you know, mm. telling me different things. But the night after David and Charlie came in, I closed up the shop and I stopped at the grocery store on my way home. And I'm just stunned. I don't. Mm. I don't remember what I was thinking. It was probably on autopilot, but it was just not a normal run into the store, pick up something and go home. But I'm thinking everybody here knows what just happened and everybody hates me. And I don't know, you know, what's going to happen. And I walked through the double doors and then into the store and suddenly the Holy Spirit, the word of God comes to me from Timothy. It says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Wow. And suddenly I realized the sound mind came part sound mind part came through and like nobody here knows hmm. this is just something that happened to me you know maybe it'll blow over i don't know but suddenly all the fear was gone and i've never had any any concern or worry since then but it was just from the time that david and charlie left got the first phone call till i walked through that grocery store and i oh okay god's in control nothing can happen outside of his permission and command that's that's powerful, Jack. Now you told about when this this couple came in. Tell me about the first time you realized you were being prosecuted by the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. Oh uh, well, shortly after, like a week or two after, they had a protest out in front of our store, and uh, some news media came by, and and I did an interview with one of the newsmen, and then they said that they were coming back for another bigger protest the following week, hmm. and. During the, one of those protests, when there was more media that came to interview me, one of the uh, reporters said, do you know that you've uh, violated Colorado civil rights? He gave me the wrong number. He said 301 201 whatever. Like, okay. Who knows all these things? I said, no, you know, I didn't know that. So I knew that there was a possibility. And, gotcha. uh, and we finally got the uh, paperwork from the state, you know, filing the complaint. And then uh, went to the Colorado civil rights division. They run it through the commission. The commission checks it out and said, yep, we have probable cause to wow. pursue this complaint. And so I think we got the actual paperwork and John knows exactly probably the date, but it was sure. probably October. So they came in in July. It's three, four months later that we were actually served the papers. Now, what was this? <clears throat> Not so much the legal details, but if this was true and you violated it, would you have to shut down? Would you go to prison? Would you be fined? What would yeah. have been the repercussions for you? At the time, the uh, statute said that I could be fined five hundred dollars per charge and up to a year in jail. A year and there were two charges, jail. so yeah. So wow. conceivably, a thousand dollars fine—that's not that big of a deal. But two years in jail, yeah, the, the bakery shuts down, and then the commission also ruled that I had to uh, either stop creating wedding cakes or that I had to create wedding cakes for everybody, same-sex couples, whoever, and I also wouldn't by the way they wrote it, my understanding is that I wouldn't be able to, you know, participate in what the order looked like. If somebody came in and they wanted a pornographic wedding cake or whatever, mm. I couldn't say, no, I can't create that. I would have to create what they asked for. So it was a point where not just the wedding cakes, but any cake order that came in, um, I would be subject to either making it or face the wrath of the commission again. So I'm sure you thought of it this way. I think you maybe phrased it this way. So let me play a skeptic. Jack, why not just bake the cake? It's just ingredients. How much money and time, and we have Jonathan on here, would have saved his effort, Alliance Defending Freedom. Why not just bake the cake and get it over with? Because it's not just butter and eggs and sugar. Mm. It's something that I, I put my heart into. God's given me an artistic um, talent. Um, he's put me through a lot of training, different bakeries that I've worked at, different things that I've learned. And 
the reverence that I have for marriage itself. This cake is not just a cake. It's a cake that speaks volumes, they said. Mm. A wedding cake is an iconic symbol of a marriage. And this is a marriage that uh, uh, goes completely against my understanding of the Bible's definition of marriage, God's creation of marriage. So it's not just a cake. Jonathan, maybe weigh in here for a second and tell us legally <clears throat> kind of what's at stake here behind the cake. Because part of me looks at this and goes, it's just a cake. I can't believe we're making such a big deal about this. But it represents something more, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, these cases are so vital because it goes to the heart of whether we as citizens uh, have the right to choose what messages we celebrate and support. Uh, and it's so important to stress that, as Jack has repeatedly said, that he's not just fighting for his own freedom, but for all of our freedoms, even for those who disagree with him. Uh, because if the government can force him to create a cake that expresses a message that he disagrees with, then the government can force an LGBT artist to say a message that they disagree with or uh, a different Christian, or a Muslim, or a Jewish person. And these principles should protect everybody. The government shouldn't have, shouldn't have the power to step in and force someone uh, to convey a message that violates their core convictions. It's really powerful to hear you say that a part of this case is you actually want to defend the rights of LGBTQ bakers to not bake a cake with a Bible verse on it that would say something they find offensive or a Muslim who doesn't want to bake something that's offensive to their faith. So this is not just about your Christian faith. It's about religious liberty and freedom as a whole and freedom of speech. That's huge. Tell the story about when you went on the Megyn Kelly Today Show and she asked you a question and your response, I don't know if she was speechless, but she didn't expect it and was taken off guard. Share that story with us if you can. Yeah, if it's what I'm thinking of, um... Megyn Kelly um, came to Kristen Wagner, who represented me at the U.S. Supreme Court. She was on the show with me just before we went on and said that the two men, David and Charlie, couldn't be on the show today. So she'd have to kind of take their side. And so I'm thinking, well, so this suddenly turned into maybe a hostile interview. And, uh, and it was a short interview, so I wanted to make every point that I needed to right away. And so she asked me her first question. I said, well, first of all, let me explain that at Masterpiece Cake Shop, we serve everybody that comes in. We just don't create every cake that people ask us to. And I explained to her that we had decided not to make Halloween cakes or anti-American cakes or those things, sure. or even cakes that denigrate, you know, somebody who identifies as LGBT. And she said, oh, okay, what? <laughs> somebody would ask you for that? Yeah. People have asked me to make, you know, cakes that say God hates gays using the other word. I'm like, I'm not going to do that because it's the message in the cake. It's not the, you know, it's not the person asking for the cake. It's a cake that I can't do. And I really think it did caught her, catch her off guard because she had, like had her next question ready to go and stopped and backpedaled. So it gave me a point and the opportunity to make that point again. That, that's such a powerful response. Now, I want you to both weigh in on this from your perspectives, but at the heart of this is free speech, as I understand it. So Jack, tell me why making a cake in your mind is an act of speech when i when a client comes in and a customer comes in and uh like this grandmother that's like 103 um i sit and i talk with the with the client i said you know so what do you need when do you need it you get through all the basic points and, okay so who's it for well it's for my grandmother she's going to be 103 and okay so this has to be a very special cake this is not just mm. flour and eggs and butter what do we want to do to really impress upon your grandma that you love her, you know, that she's really special in this special time. So we sit down and we design it. I'll make sketches. I'll you know, um, take all the time that I need to, to make sure that I've got the colors and the idea that they want. And then I'm going to go back with my hands and my tools and I'm going to create something hopefully very artistic. Well, it'd be very artistic, but hopefully something that satisfies their desire mm -hmm. in, you know, the final product. And it's, it's, always art to me that's why i came up with the name or god gave me the name um masterpiece because i want it to be an artistic expression and the u.s supreme court has protected art as speech we even have a, a picture hanging in the show in the store in the show showroom of uh an article that came out shortly after we opened and uh newspaper article said that walking into masterpiece cake shop is like walking into an art gallery of cakes and I, wow. bingo, that's what i want 
this Interesting. is this is art this is speech so the government has protected art as free speech baking a cake is art at masterpiece cake cake shop you should have that free speech that makes sense jonathan do you want to add anything legally to that yeah i mean the u.s supreme court has a pretty broad definition they protected video games as free speech and as jack was noting when you walk into a room and you see a three-tier white cake everyone knows hey this is a wedding cake and the message it's communicating is there's a wedding going on there's a marriage and let's celebrate that's what weddings are all about so to force someone to handcraft that 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 you know piece of artwork really does send a message that this is a, a wedding this is a marriage that should be celebrated hmm. and to force jack to do that for a, a, a definition of marriage that he disagrees with really does force him to violate his beliefs his core convictions like i said no one should be forced to do that uh, whether it be lgbt artist or any, anyone else that's really helpful we're going to jump to the supreme court and your experience being in the court the arguments what it felt yeah. like but one last question for me that really jumped out to me in your book again those of you who've just joined us we're here with jack phillips uh who's written a book the cost of my faith and you will recognize him because he's been at the heart of a supreme court ruling that now has been weighed on uh tied to whether or not a baker would be forced to make a cake for an issue that the baker disagrees with we're here with jonathan uh, scruggs who's helped defend him from the adf and one of the things you say in your book jack is you say that you believe you showed a loving attitude to Dave and Charlie through this. Now, I'm sure they would interpret it differently, probably because right. they have a different understanding and definition of love. But from your perspective, tell me why that's important to you and what that looked like. Well, it's, it's my faith and my relationship with Jesus Christ that drives my relationships with other people, including David and Charlie. And like I said, the conversation was 20 seconds long, so I didn't get to sit down and explain my, my opinions and you know my beliefs or anything like that. Um, although Charlie's mother called me up the next day and I had a short conversation with her about those things. Okay. But if we did, I would really you know want to impress on them that there are two men that I would love to serve. I'd love to get to know them and serve them every other, you know, cake for every other occasion that I could. But there are some messages that I just can't create. And so in the 20 seconds that we had, I, you know, the media wants it to sound like I just told them, you know, get out of my shop, I won't serve you. But that's the farthest thing from my mind. Mm -hmm. you know, my faith compels me. It's not a rule. You know, the, the Holy Spirit living inside me wants me to, you know, treat everybody the way Jesus Christ did through love. And uh, if I would have had more time, we could have maybe gotten past this, but uh, mm -hmm. we didn't. So as gently as I could, as, you know, I, sorry, guys, I can't create that cake. What? Mm -hmm. I'll so, you know, serve you in every other way that I can, but I can't create that cake. Mm -hmm. So I try to express it gently and compassionately with love, but two sentences, it's <laughs> difficult. Okay. But at least it wasn't a text. It was face to face and they could see okay. what I meant. Good. I, I, I love that. Now, t tell me a little bit. This is in your book, how you personally suffer because of this. You mentioned relationally, your reputation, your time, your finances. Just walk us through a little bit of how this personally affected you and your family um, going through this case for years. Yeah. Well, the uh, when the commission ruled that I had to start making every wedding cake that came across my thing, and I, I had to actually they required me to report to them quarterly for two years for any cake I turned down for any reason. If I didn't have enough flour or you know, oh my, my schedule goodness. was full, I would be forced to, you know, report to them. And then when we had to uh, make the decision, do we keep making wedding cakes or do we stop? Wedding cakes were a huge part of our business. Mm. And you know, I had employees just specifically for wedding cakes, basically a, a delivery man who, gives up every Saturday of the year, basically, because you never know when a wedding can come in and he could come in at seven in the morning on Saturday and be running cakes from one corner of the city to the other all day. And then, you know, on Friday and Saturday, long weddings or other deliveries that we had. And then part-time uh, people working for me out front to do the wedding consultations and I jump in and, you know, make sure that we got everything right, but they would handle all the samples and everything. Um, just the bookkeeping, there are just so many aspects to this 
And when they took away the wedding business, we went from 10 employees down to four. And I was one of them. My daughter was a full-time employee and the other two were part-time. So um, it was really hard, not, not hard to say, you know, like, what is God doing? You know, I know what he does is good and right. And I just want to be obedient and follow what he asked me to do. Sure. I know that, you know, if we close down the, have to close down the bakery, I'd be fine with that so long as I did it for a reason that was honoring to him. And if he got us through this, that'd be all the more reason to say, you know, look what he did. You know, he got us through all this and he has. So, uh, but it, there were some really hard times, you know, through that, you know, financially, um, watching my wife was afraid to come into the shop, you know, just because you didn't know what the phone was going to be like. Or, sure. you know, she, <laughs> early on, I pulled up to the shop and she was talking to me on my cell. And she said, so is there any graffiti there? No, but channel two is outside you know so wow. you, you just didn't know what to expect and it was it was especially hard for them yeah i can imagine that would be just difficult and painful on a lot of different different levels um let's let's jump to the scotus case and i forget what chapter yeah. it is but you start describing that ad in fact let me ask one more question for jonathan yeah jonathan why did the alliance defending freedom take this case well, I think we saw that across the country, people like Jack, other creative professionals were really being targeted in this type of environment by these types of laws. Uh, and that's actually proven even after Jack's Supreme Court case that people are using these laws as, almost as an arm of cancel culture, right? To isolate people that hold certain religious views, particularly about marriage, and to target them, to come after them. Hmm. And it, it is really unfortunate because that happens, then uh, you know where where are the Christians going to be involved in these industries to live out their faith, to love and serve the people they interact with? So we need that as a vital principle to say the government shouldn't have this power, and that people of shape should be able to bring their faith into their works, into their jobs, and into the public square. Uh, that's the that's the best thing in a pluralistic society that we learn to live with each other and to disagree with each other with tolerance. So very quickly, were there other bakeries that would have designed a beautiful cake for this same sex couple proximate to where your shop is, Jack? There is one. I could walk there in two minutes and a, a wonderful cake shop. They do beautiful work. Um, you just go out of my parking lot through the intersection to the next parking lot. And they're right there. And I think the Supreme Court briefs uh, said that there were 67 or 87 bakeries that advertised in gay friendly magazines that they would create um, wedding cakes so it wasn't like okay. i'm the only game in town they could have gone pretty much anywhere and then they actually did get their cake given to them for free oh wow on top of that very interesting yeah. okay describe for me the day you're waking up and you are going to the supreme court of the United States. Like I, I'm reading this in your book and I'm putting myself in your shoes going, my alarm goes off, I'm putting on a suit presumably, and I'm going into the most powerful court in the world. What were you thinking yeah. and what are some of the things that stand out that you saw during that day going into the court? And then we'll get to some of the oral arguments. Yeah, yeah we went in through a side door, but out on the sidewalk in front of the uh, court there was a rally going on. I don't know how many people, there's hundreds of people, maybe, I don't know, dozens, okay. <laughs> but more people than I would expect. And uh, three quarters of them were supporting us. They were holding signs and banners and, and yelling and screaming. And, and there were people who hated us and you know, holding the opposite signs and, and just going in the court. And once we get into the court, um, you have to go through you know, one hallway, down this hallway, over here and wait here. And, and the halls were full of people and mm. you don't know which ones are on your side which ones aren't and so they you know the attorneys you know follow me go over here go over here and then uh there were federal marshals court marshals there in the hallways maintaining absolute science silence it will be quiet in here and then the noise drops down to nothing and then people start murmuring and the volume builds up it will be quiet in here you'll be moving wow just to make sure that you understood that this is not traffic court. This is yeah. the United States Supreme Court. So then we finally 
go up through, you go through security a couple of times and you're not allowed to take anything in there but a pencil and a paper, no cameras, mm -hmm. no phones, no anything. And and you just, when they lead you into the room, we were there quite a while before the justices came in and before it started, I'm thinking 45 minutes to an hour before where we had okay. to sit there again in absolute silence because there were marshals in there too. And uh, I looked from one corner to the other and I realized that not only was I would, you know, the center of the of the arguments here. I was actually like seated in the very center of the room. Uh, that was wow. That was kind of cool. <laughs> wow. But uh, then when the justices come out, you know, all rise yeah. and we all stand up, and there's Ginsburg and there's Thomas and Roberts and Kennedy, and it's like I've been reading reading about all these people, and here they are, and. You know, they're just gonna they're gonna rule on my future, but not only my future because I'd realized before this that this isn't just Jack and making wedding cakes. This is every American's right to live and work according mm -hmm. to their conscience, without fear of punishment. And they're gonna listen to the arguments today, and then they're gonna retire, and then gonna make their decision. And uh, you know, people will ask me, "What's it like to testify there?" And there was no testifying on my part. It was just yeah. Kristen Wagner. The attorney goes to the podium and the nine justices just start asking questions and she has to feel them and answer every question accurately, quickly, compellingly, go to the next question, go to the next one and go to the next one. You don't know what the subject's going to be, but she was completely, absolutely, stunningly prepared for these arguments. It was pretty cool. Jonathan, I'm going to ask you to paint the picture so we understand legally what's going on. But one of the things in your book I didn't know is that I think you said about 70 seats for the public. It's first come, first serve, and people camped out for five days, brought their own food to get in. That's amazing to me. Now, Jonathan, paint, kind of give us a sense of how long does this go, uh, who testifies, what are the judges trying to accomplish as if we are viewing this, what would it be like if we were sitting there watching this take place? Well, there's no testimony from witnesses, as Jack said. It's just okay. nine justices up there and asking questions to lawyers, to two lawyers, one from each side. So our our, our attorney, Kristen Weider, went first, and any justice could ask, ask any question about really anything at any point. So it's really a quick-fire situation. You've got to think on your feet. Uh, the justice can ask any type of legal question, any type of factual question. Wow. What happened on this date? Or what about this case, about this detail? And there's a lot of time and effort that goes into that, right? In preparation. Sure. To do mock run-throughs and, and asking question after question to practice. Uh, the whole thing lasts about an hour, and it is a very intense session, as you can imagine. But Kristen did a great job, and I, I think it, it showed in the result that you know, ultimately in the day, the Supreme Court ruled seven to two. You know, uh, two away from a unanimous verdict that the state of Colorado showed hostility towards Jack's faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really unfortunate uh, that it came to that. Uh, that. That's the reason we have this Constitution is to protect people of different faiths, different views. And the government should doesn't have the right to show hostility to single out Jack just because of his religious beliefs right now. Jack, one of the things that seemed to be most biting to you from the Colorado Civil Rights Commission was that they compared your refusal to bake this cake to the Holocaust, those who perpetrated it. Now, you share a personal story about yeah. if it was your father, grandfather, I forget. When I read My that, I th share that story if you don't mind. Yeah, and again, because of opening the cake shop and my dad coming down, you know, pretty much every morning got to know him better. But uh, one of these commissioners called religious freedom a despicable piece of rhetoric and then compared my faith to, you know, perpetrators of the Holocaust and slavery. And it's like you either have no understanding of the Holocaust or <laughs> I don't know. But my dad served in World War Two and he landed on Normandy and he fought in France and he fought in Germany and he took a, a terrible wound in his back in a mortar attack and they shipped him back to England and patched him up and sent him back into combat. And he ended up being part of a group that liberated Buchenwald prison concentration camp. And he talked about the, the smells and just the oh. horror of that. You can look up pictures of Buchenwald. It's not just like 
County Prison. It was one of the you know, horrific prison concentration camps of the Nazis. And for this woman to compare my decision not to create a cake that violated my faith to that horrible situation was just ludicrous. Oh, my goodness. That seems to bite as deeply as it could that you almost wouldn't yeah. be here presuming you were born after that. Maybe that's not the case. <clears throat> much after that, yeah. M- much after that. after that. Yeah, actually, that makes no sense mathematically for me to pause. Of course, much yeah, after go. that. <laughs> Got it. Um, God, I can't believe that that comparison would be made. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Now, so that case is done. It's all in one day. You don't come back. Was it about right. six months until you heard? Is that the time span? Yeah, we went to the Supreme Court December the 5th, 2017, and we were in there for about an hour and a half. They extended okay. our argument time, and, and that was pretty cool. Then we went out and did the rally and and did some things in D.C. and then headed home and waited for the decision. And the decision didn't come until June of 2018. And I really expected the decision to come on the last day of the of the session, which we were had our case granted in 2017, June 2017, on the very last day. The last thing that they were doing that day was announcing the cases they would take and releasing the opinions. So I was expecting it to be the last day this time too. And one of my sisters called me up and said, Are you, you know, keeping track of SCOTUS blog. And SCOTUS is Supreme Court of the US and there's a blog right. site that tracks the United States Supreme Court. I said, well, no, I really hadn't because I'm not expecting you know to hear anything till you know next couple three four weeks, but I turned on my computer that morning and I was watching the SCOTUS blog, and I see the blog and it says looks like you know, we have whew, I can't you know I lose my voice even now a couple of years later but that morning I could not speak we have um, we have masterpiece cake shop and it looks like they win seven to two wow so I just I can't call anybody because I can't talk. So I'm texting people and then the phone starts ringing. Cars are driving by our shop. They're honking. They're waving. The newspapers are calling. It was just a crazy day. And, you know, I, I think that God gave the United States 200 years ago some very brilliant people to put together this government mm-hmm. that we have from scratch, mm-hmm. including the judicial, judicial system. And it worked. It worked well that time. Unfortunately, it's populated by people, so it doesn't always work. But I know God was gracious to our country to give us this wonderful system that we have. And to be there that day and, and know what was going on and how powerful this court is and what that meant, not, again, not just for me, but for all Americans, was just overwhelming. Jonathan, what was your impression of this case? Were you surprised <clears throat> in any fashion? What did you expect going into hearing the ruling? Well, I mean, we were confident in our arguments. Uh, hmm. We were hopeful that we were, were going to win, whether on free speech, as we talked about, or the free exercise of religion. And we were just excited, not just that we won, but it was a 7-2 to two victory. This was a, a close call in, in some way. And, and again, to get the vast majority of the court on the same page and saying the government can't single out religious people, even when they're expressing their views on marriage. Because in our day and age, those, some people dislike this. Uh, and some people consider them controversial. And to get that clear statement from the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, it, it's so vital. That freedom of speech should go both ways. It shouldn't just be for those who hold Amen. certain opinions. Yeah. It should be for those who agree with the government. It, it, it should protect people of, of faith across the board. And so that was such an important decision uh, to get reaffirmed uh, in Jack's victory. Now, Jack, presumably you think this is done. You can go back to baking cakes, but there was Masterpiece Cake Shop 2. Yeah. Can you tell me yep. what happened uh, with a follow-up? Yeah, so the day that the court granted our case back in 2017 was another busy, crazy, chaotic day. And on that day, um, we had a phone call from an attorney here in Colorado, and this attorney requested that we would create a, a custom cake, and the cake would be blue on the outside and pink on the inside, and the colors were to celebrate the gender transition, the changing from a male to a female. And again, we tried to explain to this person, that's not a cake that we can create, that's a message that we can't promote, but we'll sell it, gladly sell you, you know, anything in our store or make other custom work for you. But that wasn't good enough, so this, this attorney filed a complaint with the same Civil Rights Commission that uh, 
attacked us in the first case. And they found three weeks after we get our victory at the Supreme Court and the oh, United geez. States Supreme Court <laughs> um, told the commission that you were hostile to Jack and his faith and you can't do that. And you didn't treat him equally with other cake shops and bakeries in town and you have to. And they ignored that and you know decided that they were going to take up this new case. And so they did. But then in the following March, um, they dismissed the charges and they dismissed the charges because we have a recording of one of their public meetings where they said that they were going to be even more hostile to me and my faith. And oh, the first gosh. question was that they embraced that. And so the, the commission dropped the case. But then the attorney who's filed that complaint waited for a certain amount of time, you know, legal window, whatever, and then filed a civil complaint against me. So we're back in court again for Masterpiece 3. And just in March, we just finished uh, the trial, uh, bench trial with that case. And this attorney, in during mediation, um, the mediator asked me one time, or asked us all, have you two had a face-to-face -face conversation? And we hadn't. It was just a phone conversation asking for the cake that day that the court granted our case. Would that be something that could be set up? And so um, back in November, this attorney and myself went to uh, a cafe in a local community here. And Jonathan Scruggs met me and took me over there. And, and we sat for a couple hours and, and uh, talked about these issues. And toward the end of this conversation, this attorney told me that, well, you know, if you win this case or if it's thrown out on any technicality, I will come back the next day with another cake and we'll start all over again. Oh, my goodness. And so part of this this attorney's reasoning is that um, filed a lawsuit to uh, correct the error of my thinking. And wow. uh, if the courts back that up, that's a very frightening thought for any American, for any person yeah. in the world, but for an American where we have these these liberties clearly written in our constitution, um, it's a pretty frightening thing. Jonathan, on Masterpiece Cake Shop 2 and 3, how is the legal strategy a little bit different than the initial one that went all the way to the Supreme Court? Well, it's similar principles, but it, it is a different request for a different cake. And as Jack noted, the, the facts, I think, of, of this are even more egregious, right? That this attorney had, all, had also requested other absurd cakes, like cakes with celebrating Satan. Uh, Satan, uh, you know, or also had emailed uh, the government and asked, it, asked the government to prosecute Jack. Uh, numerous times. So this was not some happenstance encounter. This is really uh, harassment, pure and simple. The, the, someone using these laws to try to cancel Jack Phillips, not because of what he's done or anything he's done, but because of what he believes. Hmm. Uh, and that and that's why the First Amendment exists. The First Amendment exists to prevent, uh, whether it be a private party or the government, or the private party using the judicial system or the government, from trying to target someone like this. Yeah. So we're going to, we're using the same arguments. We've won in Masterpiece 1, we've won in Masterpiece 2, and we're confident we're going to win this case as well. Jack, what have you learned through all this? I mean, this has been years. I can't imagine how draining yeah. it is. What have you learned personally, spiritually, relationally about yourself? Give us a couple life lessons that we could take away from your experience. Yeah. One of the obvious ones is if this can happen to me, because I'm just a you know small businessman in, in a small business here in Lakewood, Denver, Colorado, it can happen to anybody. But we knew right from the start before we opened our cake shop that there were cakes that we couldn't create. We've discussed that a couple of times here. Um, but we drew our lines in the sand. And then um, one of the things that we decided we wouldn't create was Halloween cakes. So every year uh, people call us up and ask us to create mm -hmm. these cakes. And we get the chance to explain that we can't. And I, I believe that was, you know, God's grace in giving us practice so that when the, the big event comes up, it didn't catch us off guard. We were already used to this is our line and we can't cross it because it would you know, dishonor my God and, and I wouldn't be faithful. And so when this one came up, we knew where we would stand. So that's one of the main things that I'm so grateful for that God has provided everything we need. Even those trials leading up to it were practiced to get to the big trial and then to watch his provision through all of this, you know, not just supplying ADF, which sure. I, I couldn't afford to take a lawyer to lunch, let alone have <laughs> you know, 
a team of lawyers working beside me all the way through for almost nine years now. Yeah. Just he's provided so many things and shown his grace and his mm. love and his, you know, uh, eventually he'll show his, you know, justice and, and sovereignty that way too. So it gives us the opportunity to share our faith so many times. Um, we have a joke that we should open a cake shop because sometimes the conversations have nothing to do with bakeries and people just come by to mm. see the baker or whatever. They come to encourage me and we get to encourage him. So just seeing God's provision, his faithfulness and, and his love has been just the most wonderful thing that has happened through all of this. A, a final question for you, if you could role play with me. Obviously, there's people watching this. There's people <clears throat> who see this very differently because they have a different right. worldview. And when interpret you not baking the cake as being discriminatory, hateful, and unloving. If somebody says to your calls and says, Jack, you're a bigot, just bake the cake, what would you say? Um, you know, it, it depends on how the conversation can unfold, but hopefully I will share that my faith is in Jesus Christ, that I have a, a strong relationship with him and I want to honor him, but that it's not the person who's asking for the cake, it's the cake itself and try and, if possible, you know, like, what do you do for a living? And then show, you know, why oh, paint houses or whatever it is, and then try and find common ground where, um, you know, I'm, I'm a, a singer, okay? So if, if you were, uh, you know, a singer who maybe a Muslim singer, you would now be required to sing at an Easter service. You know, would it be loving for me to make you do that or whatever? You know, just try and find some some correlation where they sure. can understand that there's a reason that I couldn't create the cake, and it's never, hmm. never, never the person who's ordering the cake. And I want to show love and grace through the relationship that I have with Christ. Well, Jack, I'm sorry that you have had to go through this, but uh, I've been following this from afar, and I'm just grateful that you've tried to honor the Lord through this, tried to be loving towards people as best you can, but also stand up and kind of take the hits, so to speak. You have a line in the book that says, you know, we lose liberty and freedom when people don't stand up, and that's not yeah. going to happen on your watch. So I love yeah. that. It's a book of courage. It's wonderfully written, just draws you in. The story's fascinating. I hope viewers will pick up the cost of my faith. And uh, Jonathan, thanks so much for what you do at ADF. Uh, this is yep. one of the most important cases today, and we appreciate you coming behind, Jack, all the things you do to preserve religious liberty, not just for Christians, but for all Americans, regardless right. of their worldview, regardless of their faith. That's a good. So... Appreciate it a ton. Hey, those of you watching, make sure you hit the subscribe button. This channel is brought to you by Talbot Apologetics. And uh, we have a fully distance master's program. We would love to partner with you and train you to be a resource in your church, your family, your community. There's information below. And again, make sure you hit subscribe. A couple interviews we have coming up with Michael Wilder. has a fascinating book, and it's a story kind of like yours, Jack, where he actually was on a mormon mission trip and ends up from his perspective discovering yeah. the real jesus and paying the price for leaving the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints we also have an interview yeah. coming up with carl truman who wrote what i think is one of the best books i've read all year the rise and triumph of the modern self you are not going to want to miss this and by the way those of you enjoy this channel i'm making some huge changes coming out in the next week so stay tuned some really cool stuff is coming Jonathan, Jack, hang on. Don't disappear. Uh, but to the rest of you, thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this, please consider sharing it with somebody. It helps us here at Talbot Apologetics to spread the word. Have a wonderful night. Thanks for tuning in.